This is the Telos Podcast by Telos Writer. This is funded by Telos Worker Proposal. And today, this is one of the cornerstone shows for people to listen to when they're getting into Telos or people who want to dive deeper and know what's really different, what's exciting about Telos versus EOS. Today, we've got Douglas Horn, who's been part of Telos since the very beginning. And this is one of the most exciting Telos podcasts we have had yet. Today's Um, show is sponsored by Spores, an audio, haptic, and kinetic puzzle box built by Hybrid.Games. Using sound touch in your phone's physical motions, you'll learn how to unlock and collect unique digital items on the EOS blockchain. Visit Hybrid.Games to learn more. I am on the beta waiting list for Hybrid.Games. I can't wait for that to come out. And today's show with Douglas Horn, we cover Rex, and there's going to be some really possibly uh, good staking rewards coming up. So it's something definitely want to pay attention to the economic development plan, possibly a million Telos per month being given back to the users, Uh, the EOS versus uh, Telos price comparison and how maybe you can consider that arbitrage opportunity and just where Telos is headed fast, all the special things happening that are new that even some people that are involved in Telos don't quite know about yet. It's some really cool stuff. I mean, the IPFS that's on Telos, when we talk about that, that's one of the most interesting parts of the show. So without further ado, here's Douglas Horn. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. The Talos Podcast. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Welcome to the Telos Podcast, Douglas Horn. It's great to have you here today. Hey, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. There is so much going on right now. Um, what's most interesting to you that's happening in, in uh, Telos right now? Uh, I think the most interesting thing has to be the um, the TED plan, right? The Telos Economic Development Plan that's uh, just finished voting. It was a wild wild success with the voters, but um, there was a little bit of last minute drama, like a good movie, and, um, and we're addressing that, and by the time this comes out, I think that'll all be, all be done and settled, but um, that's quite a story because it, it's really going to change the face of Telos, develop, uh, Telos you know, uh, marketing and, in, and Telos for investors and just token omics, uh, you know, in a big way, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, that's that is one of the most exciting things. That's something that's such a different part of Telos also that we haven't seen necessarily be done successfully on any of the other DPoS chains yet, uh, where basically the chain should be funding itself and paying for things to get done so it can move rapidly. So what uh, can you explain what the Telos economic development plan is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Telos economic development plan uh, is a way to recognize the fact that we have uh, a pool of funds that are available for use and not benefiting anyone right now. And at the same time, so that's number one. Number two, we have some real economic needs that need to be, you know, that need to be faced, uh, such as block resources are simply not making enough to stay in business, and that's bad for Telos. Um, we, uh, you know, the Telos Foundation has gone through their money you know, wisely, but they need more and they're a good way to spend money, right? Because they're, they're uh, actually a really great organization that nobody else has that lets us do things. Um, uh, and so we need to fund them and so we need to, and, we, and then uh, we really want to in- attract investors, right? So, so because if we just give away a bunch of money, like through more WPS and things like that, which is a very successful program for Telos, but if we just keep giving away money or keep paying every more, it just it just is going to be downward sell pressure on the on the coin. So we need to have an offsetting way to make investors and speculators excited about Telos um, because that's just a missing piece that we haven't done yet. And so we're using two things there: uh, we're we're cutting the inflation on the chain to zero for probably a few years. Um, and uh, which people like, but even better, we're, we're creating very significant Rex staking rewards for T Rex, and uh, certainly I think they'll be the the highest uh, among any EOSA chain by you know by one or two zeros. So 
that's exciting. That is exciting. I mean, the idea of paying block producers a, a wage that keeps them all in business, it, it keeps the chain so secure. That, that's, a, that's a huge one. And then the idea of attracting investors, the Telos Foundation, this entity that's running the chain, taking control of it to attract investors is, is huge too. That's something that when, when you look at the EOS chain, it's, you have this separate entity in block one who kind of almost wants nothing to do with the business of driving token value. I mean, they can't have very it. Very they're very, they're hamstrung by their regulatory exposure. Yeah, and so it's so it's so fantastic to have this chain funding an entity that is actually in charge of driving some sort of value to the chain because the 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 economics of it is so interesting. Like you said, there's the worker proposals, but that ends up being kind of driving uh, token value down because people are cashing the worker proposals in as a paycheck. Our customer does. I think long term, it's it's yeah, it's immensely valuable. I think it's it's literally the reason we're talking right now, right? Um, so what did we want? We wanted to get talented people who are good at marketing, who are good at coding, who are good at um, you know other other things that are important for the chain. We wanted to attract them, and more than anything, we should talk about the Telus Core Dev, the TCD. But more than anything, we wanted a batch of of um, developers who would m make money. And so they do it consistently by maintaining Telos or by doing or by doing special utilities for Telos, doing things here and there. Because the bigger the group of people you have who make their money from you, the more stable you are, especially if they're developers, right? So we want the, we want those developers to basically go, hey, I, I think the thing is we want people to go, hey, I'm a I'm a you know I'm a I'm a ESIO developer and I have a project here and a project there and then but I have this pet project because I want to build a faster history node, and I'm going to do that for a couple months right now, and paid by Telos to do that, right? Those things, when they set, when their when their cycle goes through and they sell them, you know, a lot of people hold because I think a lot of people think that the, the token price of Telos is ridiculously low right now, just compared to compared to just arbitrage value against EOS, right? For a network, you can do the same thing. Um, I mean, you're. Uh, we should talk about that, like what the. What, like what the difference in price means is uh, between EOS and Telus is a very interesting. You can look at that and say that is the exact value of network of network value, and is that high, too high, or, or too low? Because it's the only difference, right? So, um, so we need to. Yes, it depresses prices when people sell, but long term, it it really rises. It, it's going to raise the price because it's going to keep the chain safe. It's going to bring in marketing like this. It's going to bring in. Um, uh, new development work. So it's you just have to balance. You have to find a way to balance the short term, you know, down price with with the long term. And everyone, everyone who votes, I think, should be saying, "Is this does this pay for itself?" Mm -hmm. Right? Like with this, with yours, right? Is this is the value that Telus is going to get from from the Telus podcast? You know, with Happy Money Man, is that going to be more than the cost? And I think everybody thinks that, you know, certainly we think it is. And we just want to put that test to every single thing that comes through uh, WPS. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you're talking about these incentives and all of all of blockchain and a lot of DPoS is built around getting these incentives right. And it feels like some other chains have, have neglected like large swaths of the incentives for big, big groups of people. Um, the Telos podcast is a great example. You know, uh, there there aren't a lot of incentives to run a niche podcast for a chain that if you never receive any rewards or any kind of, you know, any monetary value out of it. But it's that that niche podcast is needed because there is, you know, a core group of people who get their information through it. So um, that's just one example. You, you mentioned the Telos core developers. I mean, what a huge team that you want to pay. The block producers, what a huge important team that you want to pay. Um, getting these incentives aligned is, is such an interesting, cool part of Telos right now. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, I'm excited about it too. It's, it's a, you know, it's all an experiment and no one is going to pretend that we have this, you know, right out of the gate. I believe in iterative processes where you, um, where you just make something and then give yourself the ability to change it and evolve, uh, and the and those are tend to be self-correcting, right? So that's what I wanted 
tell us to be. I, no slam against the EOS uh, process, but their governance process is not uh, does not currently have any built-in mechanism for the chain governance to grow. It's simply whatever you know. It, it's simply whatever is is approved by 15 VPs, um, and I don't think that that is a process that's as healthy as uh, as it could be. You know, you get these you know Galapagos tortoises are dying out because it takes them you know a hundred years so, so they can breed, right? And uh, and there's like every like say there's 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 plants there's like sago palms and things like that the cycads they take forever. Um, and very other things, you know, meanwhile, fruit flies are changing all the time and, uh, and they're, you know, they're able to, to adapt to conditions. And that's what we want our, our blockchain to do. Um, and that's why we have, you know, it comes back to the ratify amend proposal that we have right now. We have a way to do that. And I think if people understood the mechanics of it, it's incredibly cool. It's a, you know the the way this is the way that the the governance documents are stored on chain, the fact that they even are stored on chain, and the fact that they can be changed clause by clause, contract controlled one hundred percent by a smart contract and 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 user voting, right? No one else does that, you know. I, and you know, I mean, there's like, like I think that Tezos does a really interesting job of governance, and I think that they are. You know, let's say right up there with Telos uh, among the, amongst the very, very top of the governance blockchains. Um, we may be doing things better than them, but I, or they may be doing things better than us. I think really it's just um, uh, an approach, right? They start with code and vote on code, and we start with uh, intent and then build code to intent, um, which I think is a thing that Dan Larimer would would really dig. But the the way this happens, and we can update our chain. You know, and update the governance of the chain is unique, and it's on the and it's, it's amongst the very top projects. Um, the mechanics of it are super cool, um, and just it's a story that nobody knows. And if they did, we'd be priced, you know, much closer to Tezos. People would like would be the, would that be our other sister chain with the, the L and Z, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the mechanics of the ratify amend and what that actually looks like from from a UX standpoint. What what's it enable people to do and how's it work? So, uh, so the mechanics of that are interesting. So, this is a contract that we a smart contract that we wrote that didn't exist uh, on the EOS uh, contracts called EOSIO dot amend. And um, there's several things that it allows you to do. But the first thing it does is it allows us to uh, load into IPFS. Uh, our, our, all our documents, all our governance documents, the, the TELUS blockchain network uh, operating agreement, right, the TBNOA, and the arbitration rules and procedures and things like that. And clause by clause, those are uploaded to TELUS IPFS. Another thing, nobody has IPFS. It's the same, basically, basically TELUS, you know, with this IPFS thing, it's essentially like Tron's, you know, release of, of uh, BitTorrent, right? But again, nobody knows about it. So, like, if you so um, yeah, so we upload these on IPFS, and then uh, when you make the proposal, and I made the first proposal, uh, all the things that were required for the TED plan, which we were talking about for about a month with the community before proposing them, we uh, clause by clause. There's there's four clauses that get changed, and there's one new clause that are added uh, to that. And anyone can see that if they go onto like chainspector.io and check, take a look. Um, those are the proposed ones. Now, if this meets the threshold. Uh, and the pass that to pass, then when I hit the close ballot, um, close prop action, uh, it's going to it's going to see if those if it fit, fit all the all the requirements. If it does, those new those new uh, documents are going to be are going to replace the previous clauses. And so and it's all done on IPFS and it's all 100% smart contract control. So there's an actual you know. So then if you go and look up. Try to look up what our what our document governance documents are. Um, you'll see the updated version. That is, I mean, the idea of a basically liquid way to to change those over time with with the community participating is is huge. I mean, that's that is how agile that is is impressive, and the fact it's all done on train. I mean, like you said, it has never been done before. What about the IPFS? Is that something that other blockchains have done before or what's the standard for that no again i mean the here, this, the story of hey we have we have governance like 
Tezos, we, we have all the, the capacity of EOS, and mm -hmm. we have FS like, like you know, Tron uh, is talking about their, their BitTorrent thing. I mean, that's all in one chain that nobody knows about, um, which is kind of it shows how poor we are in marketing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. so, um, or how much room we have for improvement. So IPFS is called is interplanetary file system. What it is is a decentralized file storage system. So um, it's like the hard drive. You know, if you think about a blockchain as a computer, where there's you know there's a, a CPU that's handling the smart contracts, and there's RAM that's storing stuff in short term memory, and and all these other things. The hard drive is actually missing. It's very hard to run, you know, a computer without that, right? So if you want to stay, if you want to store, so if we are storing, you know, a dragon token and it's got certain graphics and things that go with it, there's no way really to store that on an EOS IO chain. You can store it in a RAM, but it's tremendously expensive and it's just not intended to be done that way. So you want to store it on some kind of server. Now, like what CryptoKitties does is they're storing it on the company server. So you may still, you know, you may own your CryptoKitty forever, but as long as the graphics are stored on a company server, um, if that company server goes down, you own the crypto kitty, but the, the pictures are gone, right? And since that's literally all that there is to crypto kitties whatsoever, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that you're missing a lot. So, um, so what you should do, what we want to have is a decentralized hard drive, right? That's operated by a bunch of people all over the world that no one has the ability to, 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 to shut down or, you know, and, and so we built that. And, um, that was actually, again, like a lot of these governance features, this idea of IPFS uh, for tele for EOSIO was going to was supposed to be you know um, part part of the big picture roadmap from way back that just has not been built yet. Um, it's hard to build, and it, it was built because we had a couple, we had two or three people um, who had very fortunate specialized knowledge to be able to do this, and uh, and the leader of that is um, is Stephanie. Uh, Sunshine who works here at Goodblock and and she figured out a way to make this work. I mean, there's a reason it doesn't work at other places and um, it, Because it's and we're not actually everything we do at Goodblock and Telos is open source But this is not necessarily going to be open source and the reason is um, Aside from the fact that it's a major competitive advantage advantage for Telos as a chain um more importantly, actually, is that um, is that if you did this just a little wrong, uh, it could you know you don't want people to store something on a system that they don't truly understand. They just forked right, and uh, you know that the developers just forked and and have a chance for for data to be you know lost. So and I think so. Oh, let me give you an example. So Edna uh, Greg Simpson from Edna. Has really has said uh, that Telos, that the Ed, the Edna DNA net data is all going to be stored on Telos IPFS, right? He said that, in his, so it's no longer a secret. The the you know Warbly's talking a lot about how the KYC portion of the leasing will be on Warbly, and that's great, and that's you know and we're excited to be working with them. But the data storage uh, for for all the the genetic data for Edna is going to be on Telos. And that means that anyone who wants to store their data, store their DNA, is going to have to is going to be doing it on Telos. That means that any researcher who goes and buys, um, you know, wants to lease these things uh, or buy the you know access is going to have to do it through Telos. That's big. That is the type of advantage that we get by having this this storage system. Um, and probably the reason that they're on Telos is. Uh, because nobody else was able to offer that. There's um, there's a special service through Liquid Apps that does um, that does VRAM right as a form of IPFS. But they're, to my knowledge, they're not actually offering a straight up put all your files here. Right. Mm -hmm. so, this is where you store your files. If you have graphics files that are part of your program, if you have you know if you're emanate and you have sound files that are part of your pro part of your program, th they'll go there. And so the, the, to come back to why it's important that this really work and not just kind of work, you know, imagine we get, you know, Edna gets 20,000 people signed up in their first two or three months, right? Storing the data. There's no way to reproduce that at all, right? That's, the, that's what they're saying, right? There's, that's the, the, the advantage, right? Nobody has that except what's on chain. 
well, if the if the IPFS system goes down, then that would all be lost, right? So I, it's too. We don't want this to be something where people can um, go in, fork the open source code, um, not really understand what they're doing, deploy it without all the extra secret sauce and magic juju, and um, and then you know start saying that they're accepting people's files. We don't want to be responsible for for that because it'd be catastrophic for people. So. We're being extremely careful and um, and creative and innovative with how we're actually deploying this, and um, it's going to be a huge differentiator. It already is for a lot of for a lot of DApps who are sort of um, floating just off just off scene, you know, there uh, who are, who are telling us that they're excited about it. Um, it's a it's it's a, a necessity to a lot of things to a lot of to a lot of apps, and they'll have to come tell us. Yeah, I mean, IPFS is one of those. I mean, it's like it's like the elephant in the room that people don't talk about where, okay, you have all this stuff stored on blockchain, but the actual data is stored just on someone's server somewhere. You know, yeah. the CryptoKitties is a perfect example. Like, awesome, it's on blockchain, but still the actual pictures of the CryptoKitties are just on some server, and that's what that's what you bought with your blockchain. You know, that's, yeah. that's it's, it's like a false, it's almost like a false smoke and mirrors blockchain without the IPFS technology. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is, it's not like that. It, it is. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's wild. What's the, what's the capacity of IPFS? Like how much information is possible? It's limitless. Uh, we were just, we just had a meeting on this before we, we recorded this. Um, it's, even the file size itself is actually limitless. There's no upward limit on how big a file size is. We are going to be storing things in, um, 256k chunks and there's there's a billing you know so storing a certain amount costs a certain amount of telos to upload and then it and then um uh it's it's extremely affordable and there's and and the idea of having that like we're talking about aligning incentives is um that it it, it, it encourages you know uh computer operators to actually to actually run it, right? Because it's an extra source of, most of it's gonna be block producers, and it's an extra source of, um, of income, right? Over and above just the block, the block production. Because it requires running an extra amount of infrastructure, but it also, um, you know, but it, it's, if you're already running a block producer, the, it's gonna, you're gonna make more than it's gonna cost you to, to you know to add to add this in if you weren't running a block producer it probably it's priced so that it probably wouldn't you know be worth going into just this business but we want to incentivize people to come out run great run great servers and then if they're making money on it then all they have to do is is add capacity so so there's really this could go forever and by the way I say that we're adding it that we're building it tell us to in its in its current working form, it's been it's been built um, since uh, you know late November, and it's been running since since then, right? So what we're really talking about is just get is just and everyone who uses everyone who, who uses um, uh, work proposal systems and things like that, that's they're already using IPFS on Telos. So um, we're just talking about a way to make it uh, affordable for 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 DApps to to you know, get billed every month and for, for the block producers who are operating the extra storage nodes to, um, to, you know, get paid. Mm -hmm. So as a way to picture IPFS as IPFS, like a, the same way that you'd picture a bit torrent, except for instead of just a bunch of random computers out there, the block producers are running the storage, the upload and download storage. Is that That's probably, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, that's a probably pretty good way to look at it. If the, if the, the torrent nodes were all, um, you know, were just sort of a lockdown, you know, 20 block producers or something like that. Okay. And will block producers, is this like a service that block producers are going to offer separately or is it a service that a block producer will just tag on that they're already producing and now they're tagging this on and it happens automatically? Do, I guess the question is, do you pick which block producers are doing it or are they elected or are they just tagging on to what they're already doing? Yeah, you don't know, right? So um, it, it, there's no, first, not every block producer will do this. Only some will do it. And they are incentivized by the fact that they're gonna get paid by the people uploading um, the data 
to, for the storage. So they get, so it's not just a normal IPA, it's not just a normal VP service. Uh, it requires ex extra in infrastructure and things like that. Um, so that's, that's how the pay happens. Anyone who, you have to be running a block producer type node, but, but you don't have to be one of the top 21 block mm -hmm. producers. And think about that. If we did have that and, you know, and, uh, three, you know, and everybody got voted out, that would be, you know, and then suddenly we're no longer IPFS nodes, that would be a problem. So if you're an, if you're a Telos block producer and you're running, it means you're already running minimum requirements and compliance and things like that, but but just the decentralized, um, and you want to you want to run one of these one of these um, IPFS nodes, you can, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's and we think that if we make it attractive enough, you know, that we uh, that you know get the economics right, that a lot of people will want to. Right now, we have commitments from several, you know, twelve I think, uh, which isn't more than enough, um, because just because they want to see they want to help Telos grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exciting to hear Edna is coming over. That's a, that's been a great project. I've been following it for, I mean, I introduced, I uh, didn't introduce, I interviewed them maybe eight months ago uh, and was talking about this great idea. And then, you know, Edna kind of got the bad end of a stick with, uh, there was someone basically presented their same idea at the hackathon in uh, in Africa and won like a bunch of money like with Edna's idea <laughs> and I always I, I didn't ever get to talk to Greg about that but it seemed to me like uh, you know I don't know why or how that happened but I'm glad to see Edna kind of pushing forward and surviving and, and thriving yeah. on Telos now. Um, yeah, I wouldn't speculate project. on that, but but yeah, I mean that genius. It was. It was strange, and I don't have any special information. But mm -hmm. what I do know is that um, is that they can't possibly be as far along as as Edna is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because I, you know, because we we work with them, and I and I have um, no special knowledge. But I, you know, but we're testing we're testing stuff out. There's you know, there is genomic data on Telos IPFS. You know, <laughs> controlled by the controlled by the Telus mainnet. You know that will I think when people understand that, um, and when it's ready to actually announce, even though sh um, that's going to be a big story, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's I. From what I've read about the other guys, that they're not they're nowhere near there. You only own a percentage of your DNA, things like that. I you know there's a lot of innovative things like the leasing, the ability to lease your tokens, and and. Um, you know, which is going to be uh, on Warbly, and um, you know, it's kind of it's actually a great story about how you know uh, one project can exist across three chains. Um, uh, probably most of the tokens are still going to be held on EOS, right? So um, I think it's a, I think it's kind of one of the biggest stories in crypto, or should be. And um, I know I hope he gets it out there because I think it's great for the whole EOS IO community, right? Mm -hmm. if I was if I was block one. That's the thing I would go on, you know, on the next news show with, right? Yeah. Three EOCO chains, you know, working together, storing human data, human genetic data. Um, that would be a huge story, right? Uh, so, I, I hope they I hope they run with that. Yeah, that is wild to think about. This Edna is is one of the first ones utilizing the best parts of you know whatever works for their company to to get their product out and and utilizing Warbly, Telos, and EOS is uh, you know that's an amazing feat. Uh, hopefully, that story does kind of start to to catch a little bit of traction. Um, probably need to bring Greg Simpson on the on the show again and, and chat to him on the Telos podcast because uh, yeah, that story deserves a lot of uh, a lot of digging into for sure. Um, you know, one of the other, the elephant in the room that again kind of jumps out here with, with Edna because Telos has basically come and nurtured Edna the, as, a, as a startup and kind of given what they need, the tools to, to thrive and, and, and go. And uh, the Telos is also nurturing and caring about token price or about investor value, which is which is something that other chains aren't necessarily kind of allowed to do, or it's almost a faux pas to talk about the price. Whereas, I mean, it's undeniable that a lot of people are interested in the price, you know? So to like pretend like it doesn't exist 
is is kind of rough. And, but the fact that Telos can just address it and 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 use it as one of the incentives is is a, makes it well rounded. But uh, the reason I'm saying that is because that kind of brings us into Rex, the the T Rex as you called it, that's coming up. Um, and that's something exciting for investors. Can you just talk, give a summary of T Rex, where it's at, and what's going to happen? Yeah. So T Rex is the Telos Resource Exchange, and it's a way to it's a way to take your tokens, stake your tokens instead of for resources yourself into a pool that other people can buy from that pool. Um, and you get, and the people who are staking their tokens, they get a, uh, they get a reward. Now on, on EOS, I don't want to say what it is, but I think there's a decimal point and, and at least one zero uh, in there and the, you know, the, the annual return. It's not high. Um, on Telos, what we're going to do is we have this account uh, that we're saving for the exchanges uh, for tokens that were that were on the exchanges at the time of the Genesis snapshot, we wanted to include all those people. Um, we had a very simple process for exchanges to claim those, but very very few of them have been claimed. And at this point, we say, okay, well, we're looking at um, we have no war chest because we never did an ICO, which means we can. That's one of the reasons we have the freedom to talk about token price or things like that um, because we didn't we didn't run an ICO, so we don't have any uh, regulatory exposure there compared to what other chains have. Um, we did it Satoshi style. So, um, so we can talk about that. We can, we are going to take a million tokens a month from that fund, which is going unused and put it back into, uh, directly inject that into the Rex rewards. So for example, if, if one person had one Rex, had one, uh, Telos staked in Rex that month, that million telos would come to them, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's going to be split amongst everybody, but um, it's a it's meant to be a really big incentive. You know, we thought about we thought about how do we do this? How do we well, how best do we use this this um, you know this war chest that we have, but we suddenly got right that we didn't think we were going to have? How do we use this and not just reward sort of everybody, right? There's a lot of telos accounts that we made for ES Genesis holders that have just not been claimed. And if they make it to, you know, December 20th, you know, they're going away. And we that's a year, and we said that from the beginning. Um, if it's anyone who hasn't done a single action um, on their on their accounts, those are going away. Since there's a sizable percentage of those, why would we just, you know, why, why would we just give tokens to, every, you know, just spread those across all these accounts, right? That was like one of the one of the top of mind ideas. Well, we've got extra tokens. Let's just give, let's just divvy them up evenly. But we run, you know, but it would mean we were going to give a lot to token to accounts that are just going to be just, just, you know, removed anyway. That's not good. Tell us already as, you know, we have a very low cap, a very low number of tokens compared to, to any other Yosayo token. You know, we have 350 million as opposed to, you know, there's some that have billions, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want to lower the token supply number, so we can't just cut them. Um, we, we, it makes no sense for them to sit stagnant. How do we reward people who are actually engaged in Telos? Well, to get Rex rewards, you have to vote. So now we're saying, okay, let's take a subset of people who are actually voting, uh, even if they're just voting to get the Rex. They're voting, they're engaged, they're, they're, they're using their accounts, they're not just sitting there. That's our requirement. Right, you have to be engaged at least at that level, and then if you are, then you know those are the people we want the rewards to go to. And what our hope is uh, is that people, even who are just investors, are going to come in and say, "Now wait a minute, there's this other, you know, there's this other EOSIO chain that I can get like thirty percent annual return or more in, at the start, right? Because it's crypto, so everybody at the beginning gets like, you know, gets the most." Mm -hmm. um, I get a really great, a really great return, and they're going to go. Well, now wait a minute. I've seen this before on you know Shitcoin Central. There's a, that's you know th these things are just printing money, and then they're going to find out. Actually, instead of doing that, we've actually stopped. Not only we're we getting high returns, we've stopped inflation on the on the chain. Right? It's like how do you, you know it's almost impossible to do both, except we have this big old bucket of bucket of tokens, so we have to do something with. So um, so. They're going to go. Okay, that's interesting. I guess they're not. They're not just printing money and and you know and offset. You know, the inflation offsets my reward. But is but I've also seen these chains that they have no technical advance. They're just a 
clone of a clone of a clone of a dash of and like which is a clone of you know <laughs> Bitcoin, um, and and they have nothing new. Is that the case with Telos? And then they'll see not only is that not the case, but it's the opposite is true. We're 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 not only an EOS AO chain, we're well placed on blockivity, but we're also cranking out big things, big tech like TIPFS and and um, and the voting system and a lot of other things on Telos. So we're, our hope is that the message to investors is get double digit staking rewards on a zero inflation chain uh, with that is really a technological leader and just shockingly underpriced right now. Um, uh, I, we're hoping that's what they'll that that's what they'll see. That just brings a lot of people. There's a lot. There's a huge component of people who are in crypto mostly for the speculative or investment value. And that's just the way it is. And that's not, we need to be realistic about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so how big is the, or how long will that last? How long is, are, are you able to, uh, or is Tedla, is Telos able to put a million dollars a month into the Rex? Yeah, well, it's a million Telos a month. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, although you know we should, but we are we do we should talk about those fiat on those U.S. dollar on ramp. Yeah, absolutely. June. That's a biggie. Uh, we will be able to do that for so at the current. There's some there's some thing like for example, we are still going to allow exchanges if if to to claim if if Binance wants to come in and claim all their Talos tokens for their users, they will get those, and so that will reduce the the number. Um, we're not required to, so we might be a little bit picky. Um, so if there's a, if exchanges claim that will lower it, if if um, uh, when all those accounts that are that are abandoned uh, or without ever ever having even been used once uh, come December uh, are reclaimed, those will go into those will go into T Rex uh, as well. We think probably if the numbers stay the exact same, then um, then it, we have at least 16 months of this. But um, I expect that some amounts, like as Telos doubles, right, why would we still send a million tokens to the Telos Foundation every month? Or, or, or maybe, maybe it doubles is fine, but once it you know, goes up is a four or five X, we're gonna lower some of those things uh, to realistic numbers, right? Okay. Um, that's the plan. So I actually think that if the, if the tokenomics work as we, we think um, Rex will always stay a million, um, but uh, everything else will uh, will get reduced somewhat, and then as a result, the program can stretch out. You know, three or four years. Imagine that. I mean, three or four years is is forever in crypto land, right? No, no higher staking rewards. And by that time, there'll be more tokens in the economy. So what'll happen is that there's there's because um, we're literally feeding more in through this process. Um, but there's still going to be like a seven or eight percent staking reward, which is, you know, it would be great if you could get that everywhere. Yeah, it does seem. I mean, this it's exciting to think about the balance that it sounds like Telos has found with the ability to stimulate the economy, but without inflate inflation and stimulate all this work to actually be done, and also incentivize investors. I mean. It is a, it's a really novel approach. It's really not something that we've seen done on any other change. And, and that's part of the reason I'm so excited about Telos. I mean, it, that's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, I haven't seen this experiment anywhere else and, and it's a happy accident that we have it, but let's see what happens. Let's see what happens for sure. And, and we'll, we, I want to talk about that USD on-ramp, but before we leave the, uh, what we're talking about now, um, you mentioned the arbitrage, Telos versus EOS. And how do you look at that? How do you calculate that? Or, you know, what do you consider when you're looking at those prices next to each other? Yeah, sure. Well, this is all informational. I am not advising anything. Let's get that out there. But, um, and this is mainly how I think some investors might look at it. I don't know if they are or not, but this is the logic to me. What is, what is the technical difference between EOS and Telos? Are they roughly at parity? Um, and the answer is yes. And actually with a little asterisk, not only are they at parity, but, but Telos has a lot of you know, valuable features that EOS does not have, right? So that's number one. Um, if you were to look at the, you know, are, they, are the block producers on these things actually running the same network or is one of the networks just run on a bunch of crap? Um, if you look at the, the Aloha EOS, 
charts, you'll see that Telos is actually at least as good as, as EOS. We have a we have um, a few block producers who are who you know probably more block producers in that 1.1 millisecond zone than EOS does. But um, big picture, they're comparable, right? So the same tech, the same operations, you know, in, in terms of BPs. Um, Telos actually has a few advantages here and there, but of course the network effect is not there on Telos right now, right? So what's so then we can say okay if these things are, are the same and only the network effect is different what's the value of the network effect well right now um for several for several months telos was at about one tele 100 telos per eos crazy amount for so i think so but then you realize that um then you realize that uh that there's one third of the token supply so each telos actually has three times the purchasing power of network resources, which is the primary utility of these tokens. So that means that during that period, Telos was one three hundredth, right? Three hundred Telos per EOS. So that's the you know we've climbed a bit now. It's it's higher. I don't know what it is day to day, but you know now we're at one eightieth or one seventy fifth or something like that. Still, um, there's a huge disparity in in networks that are the same except for the name. So then an investor would want to do some kind of arbitrage and say, is that the right amount? Is that network effect, um, you know, is that the right future amount? And what I've seen in crypto is a lot of people will say, well, this is this and that's that, but this should be at least be worth a 10th or a 20th, right? I mean, I think that once, once we're on coin market cap, especially with rec staking and things like that, I think it's hard for somebody not to say, you know, wow, Telos should be at least worth, you know, 20 Telos per EOS, right? Just just for their similarities for all this stuff that's going to happen. That, that of course, is more than a 10x, right, from mm -hmm. our current situation. That's what I hope people think. Um, we're try certainly trying to do everything we can to, to make that case. Um, that's, my, that's my impression, but, you know, the market will decide that. What does the – do you know what the network activity looks like compared to EOS? Well, uh, you can look on Blocktivity right now. I checked a minute ago. <laughs> uh, EOS, of course, is number one. Um, Telos is number five, I think. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to look at the records for the most ever done, uh, EOS has the most at about 80, 80 million transactions per 24 hours. Telos has the second most at 12 million transactions per 24 hours. Everybody else is below that. But let's be honest. Um, Right now, that's that's you know there are not actually 12 million real transactions happening on Telos. We have a lot of things running. Um, they're, they're real proof of concept things, but it's not real economy. The question then is how much of the EOS stuff actually is right? If we were to kind of compare apples to apples, um, are people running? Are because it's a feeless network? Are people choosing to use their resources by by you know running a bunch of a bunch of bots against their own their own gambling apps because it doesn't cost them anything ultimately. You know, I think that's probably the case. Uh, I know some people who have gambling apps and I think that's what they're doing. Um, I can't prove it. I'm not making accusations, but I think, and there've been some reports coming out that, that not all the activity on EOS is, is, you know, live customer activity. I don't think any of that matters to me. I say, look, what's the capacity? Who cares what they are? This is the earliest of early days. What's the capacity of the networks, right? And the capacity is massive, so I think it's fine. Uh, Ethereum people get really bent out of shape about that. Yeah. But the capacity, so with all those similarities, um, it's hard to know what, the, to your question, it's hard to know what the network effect um, cost it, uh, actual benefit is. Um, it's, there's something, but, um, but I, you know, that's a really huge multiple on one, on one thing when, when they're, the, it's still early days for actual economic activity on both chains. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's shift into the the carbon with the USD uh, on ramp and first what carbon is, and then talk about the on ramp. Yeah, well, you got you should have the carbon guys on too. It's such yeah. a story, but big picture, um, carbon is deploying on Telos. It's going to be called USDT. USDT. Um, they're deploying on EOS, it's USDO, or E. Um, and um, so Telos and EOS are the two chains they're gonna deploy on first, is my understanding. 
And, um, and what you can do is you can, you can do this already on EOS and very soon you're going to be able, like weeks, you're going to be able to do this on Telos. You can go and get, use your credit card and buy up to $100 a week of Telos, right, with your credit card without KYC. Wow. You can buy 1000 with KYC, um, a week with KYC. So there's, uh, and uh, so think of, you know, think about that. Now, it's not used a lot right now because it's still early days, but let's not, you know, let's look at what this lets us do. This lets us bring people on. For me as a DAP developer, you know, when I'm trying to bring people on because I want them to buy dragons or, or other assets or use our marketplace, um, the ability for them to like just straight up go and, you know, get a free account on Telos, uh, which is still a big advantage, and then go and, and buy 20 bucks worth of Telos with their credit card without giving KYC, that's amazing. What they're, and, and, and then secondarily, uh, having all this USD uh, uh, stablecoin on Telos, that really increases economic activity, especially amongst traders. Um, we've seen this like or hate uh, tether. Uh, there's no denying that once you had a stable coin in the system, it added more uh, liquidity and options for trading and then trading increased. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's huge. I, I think about, uh, I've been trying to get my girlfriend to play uh, prospectors and it's just going through, it's like, okay, well, before, before you play, set up a Coinbase account you know, then you got to wait for that to happen. Then, uh, you know, attach your bank account and then buy EOS and then, you know, stake that EOS so that you have, uh, so that you can do something with it so that you can use the network. Now you can play prospectors. Now take that EOS and go to an exchange and buy gold and now put that gold back into the product. You know, it's like, Great. And, and people like what people people aren't playing it. What? I mean, it's yeah. Game, but yeah. yeah, why is it so hard to get people to play blockchain games? Right? Yeah, exactly. It's so, yeah, it's crazy. You know, there's so many friction points um, for any users, but especially for gamers. You know, um, uh, it's you know, but we are like one of the things that GoodBlock is doing on our sort of our own projects is uh, reducing that friction. So we think that people are going to be able to come on. Uh, to D realms and be creators or be or be um, traders and you know not necessarily even have to have uh, uh, know that they have a blockchain account until they want to take it over in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with Draco's Keep. That we're trying to get this thing on Apple Store um, with with uh, you know people just looking at like a like a real game, right? Like a game they expect because it because it's the first crypto game that plays like people expect. So, you know, let's not have, you know, blockchain friction up front. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and then when they do end up, so you don't have that blockchain friction up front, and then when they do end up wanting to uh, put money into their account or claim it's just that hey, card. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Oh, just, I'll put my credit card in. Just it, it it puts it into the natural flow of UX that people expect from a game. If you just went on the Apple iTunes store, you're playing a game, and all of a sudden you want to buy some items. You put your credit card in, you buy them, and you know things happen. And and it sounds like with D Realms and and Dracos Keep, that's kind of and Good Block, that's kind of the direction that's going. And, and Carbon the USD on ramp enables that. I mean, it's huge. It's, it is huge, yeah, and, it, and it's just more options. Like, I doubt you'd use Carbon going through the Apple Store, but, but um, so we have to have a couple other solutions there. But, yeah, I mean, all these things are more options. Personally, like, I know a lot of people who would not want to put their, associate their credit cards with their crypto accounts, and I totally support that, and they don't have to, right? There's no, there's no um, uh, KYC required to do anything on the chain, but it's now it, there's going to be this option to get money uh, you know, fiat money on and off the chain um, with or without KYC um, for people who want that and to use your credit cards for people who want that. That's what we have to do. We have to be, we have to be a big tent and, and let people interact with the chain the way they choose to um, and not force them into anything, not force them to, to only use old school crypto stuff because, you know, tinfoil hat stuff, um, but also not to, not to forego, you know, not to have to use credit cards and not have to give up their identity in order to use the chain. So I think that it's a, there's a lot of option there and I think we, we cover all those bases and so, so happy that the guys from carbon 
uh, are, you know, on board and see the vision. And, you know, they ran a block, they ran a Telus block producer for a while. They may come back. Um, they really uh, are in and it's exciting and uh, it's going to be great for Telus, Telus, uh, you know, fans and holders. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's another one. I, I've actually touched, talked with uh, Carbon a little bit on, on Telegram and we've been talking about them coming on the podcast. So that'd be a great uh, different episode for Telos podcast. I mean, it's it's easy to find these shows because there's so much going on. It's, it's pretty exciting, man. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's very exciting. There's so much, so much exciting stuff happening right now on Telos. I'm, you know, I, 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 we couldn't have, we couldn't cover it all. Yeah, no. I, well, you know, something you mentioned was coin market cap. What's what's the story on that? So my understanding. Um, so the the Telus Foundation is managing all those all those relationships, and that's actually a really cool innovation also that we have because they are until now they have you know until we voted to give them a regular uh, pay, all they had though was was the the starting amount, and they've done a lot with it, and they have to work in a decentralized way, and they're and there's a lot of challenges. They are actually setting up a legal entity ship so that they can do more. So I think that's a real advantage we have because we can, you know, people can come in and, and do WPS for certain things, but there's some, there's some projects you really want somebody to manage. There's some projects where you have to have somebody sign a contract because money, you know, and with, from a legal entity, that's something that doesn't really exist for EOS, um, it does exist for War, but the, for example, because they're you know a centralized company and not a decentralized chain, so they can do that. But for a decentralized chain, it's very hard to have that. So we have that with them. They it takes a long it took a long time to get us a lot of stuff set up, and um, we had our the scenario with um, Coin Tiger uh, while it was you know just supposed to get us uh, be part of the process of getting us onto Coin Market Cap. Um, there were some things that, that uh, for me, you know, didn't go, weren't, weren't so positive for how it went. And so I think they're really, you know, d- learning from that, doubling down, um, making sure that they're with good partners, um, you know, to get on coin market cap, which is the industry standard, uh, listing service for, um, for cryptocurrencies for good or for ill, because there's, you can look up a lot of problems that people have with coin market cap. But um, but it is the standard, and and until you're on there, you're just not going to be tracked by a lot of you know automatic service services. Um, so getting on there is important to us. They've been working on it. To do that, you need to be on at least two exchanges. You need to have a certain amount uh, with the same with the same pair. So it'll be like Telos Bitcoin or Telos EOS or whatever. But the same pair, multiple multiple exchanges doing a certain amount of volume every day. So um, so we have been working, or they have been working. The Telus Foundation um, with uh, with market make professional market makers. This is something a lot of people don't know about about cryptocurrency. When new coins come along, there's very low liquidity, um, and so in order to get that liquidity in those early days, um, and that means that like instead of like having nice little jaggies uh, on your trading thing, you have huge swings, which is what we see now because there's because you know this is the sell. Off, you know, offer and this is the buy offer. And so if somebody goes and buys here, hey, we're now here and then suddenly it's back down, right? Instead of like this like real organic trading that you'd see most places. So the way to address that is with uh, professional market making services. So I've been trying to work with really good ones. What that's gonna mean is there's more liquidity, but they are financial institutions and they have to sign a deal with some entity. So there's been a lot of groundwork that the Telus Foundation has done. Fortunately, it's done now. Um, Suvi Rinkin uh, is is the president of that, and she's doing a great job. I think everyone on there's doing a great job, um, and you know we're excited to have that entity, and excited that they're going to get some good ongoing funding out of this um, uh, TED plan to to keep doing that good work. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's big news. Um, and one thing, uh, one other note I wanted to come back to here was um, what is the What's the timeline on the Rex? I, I know that's um, possibly soon, but is there a, is there a set timeline, or what's that look like? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we are doing a couple things. So right now, this is probably going to be done by the time you're, you push this out. This video goes out, but right now we are we have just pushed to the test net the fix for the the voting uh, exploit that some that somebody tried to use. 
Um, we're fixing that. That's going to go to the test net. The, um, that's something that was written here at GoodBlock uh, and tested and, and approved by, by a number of block users um, and people on the TCD. Uh, the next step, so that's going to go today, tomorrow. Those then, once, that's, once those multi-sigs are pushed to the main net, we're going to be able to close out out. And then we're officially, we've officially been, uh, uh, we've officially, you know, been authorized by, by the 97% of voters who voted for it um, to, um, to, uh, to move forward with that. So we then have to get the, uh, we then have to push out the, a couple of uh, improve, uh, a couple of changes that are already being written for, for Ted, uh, for how things get pushed around. And then finally, we have the Rex stuff on board, but on, on but we need to we want to test everything. One thing that happened a couple months ago is there was a there was some kind of corruption on the producer table on our test net. So our test net went down for a while. Um, it was very vexing, and um, we want to be extremely careful that we don't expose the main net to the same problem. So we're we're being cautious. Um, it, you know, the test net stopping for a week and then getting started up and getting rolled back, you know, a hundred or a hundred uh, blocks or something. That's no big deal. It's a test net. Um, if that were to happen in mainnet, that would be, you know, catastrophic. And uh, it happened on EOS and everybody was fine with it because, or, or you know, they got through it because it was EOS. But I don't think Telos right now has the, has the, we never want to do that. And I, and I don't think we have a cachet yet to, to get over such a gaffe. So we're being super cautious because we don't want to we don't want to mess with people's um, money or people's uh, uh, you know feelings about Telos. But it's coming very soon, as soon as we can safely do it. And I think that that could be um, within two weeks. I think that the BPs are gonna the BPs we're gonna try to get them that pay fixed and everything else done a little bit sooner because it's easier and we can do that. We have that code and it doesn't it doesn't require the upgrades that um, that might risk some challenges um the bp pay on friday will go from three percent to two percent um and uh we've already approved six percent so for a lot of bps who are who are struggling we want to get that done we want to be we're sensitive to the fact that that we're basically paying ourselves first but you know getting rex implemented is is just a bigger task and um i think i think in two weeks uh three at the outside uh, it should be going. I want it tomorrow because I think it's a huge, huge win for Telos. I would rather if I could, ha if I could have, uh, if we could do the Rex first and the BP pay later, I would totally do that because I think it's such a big move for for Telos for people wanting to hold it. But um, but it's just you know it's just a little bit harder of a task. Absolutely. Well, th this is a lot of lot of big news. I mean, this this feels like a pretty comprehensive just vote for Telos right here because uh, anyone who listens at all, all the way through is going to be excited about everything that's going on. Um, and, and what, what a cool, what a cool recap of everything that's happening right now. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to touch on or dig a little bit further into as we, as we kind of come towards the end of the show here? Uh, boy, yes, yeah, you know, I'm not really good at touching on stuff. I mean, <laughs> talking about it. It's, you know, you know, uh -huh. But, um, but there's so much, there's so much happening right now. I think we've, I mean, we've talked about the TED plan. We've talked about double digit staking rewards. We've talked about the fact that Telos has IPFS and it's being used by apps and we're the only ones who have it. Uh, we've talked about, you know, we've talked about the governance, the historic governance that puts Telos at the, you know, in the top two or three governance blockchains in the world. I mean, what, what, what more should we talk about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk about the incredibly comically low um, price of Telos relative to EOS. So I think those, I think those are the high points for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a good cornerstone episode for anyone who's interested in just starting to look into Telos. Uh, people who've only looked into EOS at this point, coming to look at Telos, people who've only looked into uh, any things outside EOSIO. Um, yeah. This, is, this is just good information for people I, to have. To it, thank you. I would say one thing we should talk about really shortly, briefly, is there are these people who do not know that they have Telos accounts, right? Oh. Mm -hmm. They do. So if you have, if you were an EOS Genesis account holder and you were on the snapshot, 
You also have this, you also, we also made you, no need to claim and get scammed. We also made for every EOS Genesis snapshot holder, a Telos snapshot with their own, with their own keys. And we also rekeyed about 200 people who, who sent, you know, who sent, uh, um, proof, you know, that they that their keys have been taken. By the way, we also have arbitration. We haven't even talked about that, but no, no chain in the world has that, and it's smart contract and control. That's another. That's another one um, where we can get people's keys lost and stolen keys back that way too. And no, no other chain has that. Um, so uh, EOS did a one-off thing, which is fantastic, but as an ongoing thing, they, they can't. Um, so I would say that um, if you have these accounts. We've given everybody a year. That year is up in December 18th, 19th, 20th, something like that. But, um, you know, go claim. I do not want to get those tokens back. I want everyone, go claim those tokens, right? They're sitting there. Um, hold on, you know, claim them. Do one, vote once or stake or unstake once and forget it and come back in a year. But do yourself a favor because, you know, something you're going to be kicking yourself. You could have, you know, free, free tellos. But please do not, what to not do, is do not go to any kind of Telos Foundation, you know, uh, website that's trying to steal your keys um, because people have fallen for that and, and it's, it's sad to be in the club, the very large club of cryptocurrency projects that have had people like spoof, you know, spoof their identity to try to rob people. But yeah. so don't fall for that, but do just go open your wallet, open your, open your scatter and just add the Telos chain and look for your Genesis account and it'll be there. Do one thing, it's yours forever. So I think that's, if you're, if you're an EOS person, these things sound good, you may already, you may have already won a bunch of Telos. So yeah. wait for it. Don't, don't let us take it away and hold on to it because, you know, a year from now, um, uh, you know, I think you'll be really happy or really upset that you, <laughs> didn't claim or or claimed and sold. Absolutely, go go claim your telos, make it happen. Go check out Dracos, Dracos Keep. Um, go check out uh, what Edna's doing, and um, yeah, it, telos is doing big things. Drealms.io, it's gonna be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Drealms.io is. I, let's let's briefly touch on that because that that's a that's a big one that that'd be good to just touch on as as a last topic on the show here. So, can you tell what D Realms is? Yeah, so D Realms is something we're working on, very excited about. Um, if you think about the Oasis, right, right, uh, from Ready Player One, and you think about uh, what that might be like with all these kinds of different game assets and characters and everything that play with each other, right, not just siloed um, to one company's assets. That's what we're building, essentially. Um, everybody else is, you know, people who are saying they're doing that are trying to do a, like a, a single silo version, right, where you can, you certainly, you can sell, you know, Fortnite assets back and forth to use in port with other players to use in Fortnite, which is better than what you have right now, but you can't take those Fortnite assets and use them in Halo, right? You can't take them and use them in Battlefield 1, you know. But, um, and we're not saying we can immediately do that, but we're building an ecosystem where these tokens are, made in a way uh, that's going to empower user-generated content to, to bust out a whole huge amount of tokens uh, of game assets that can work together in games or in realms, which would be, you know, how we imagine um, the, the sort of the Ready Player One planets, right, where things can work together and it can be a, you know, Dungeons and Dragon realm where you can, you can go through somebody's dungeon and, and, you know, buy a key over here to, you know, to, to get to the, to get, you know, and then sell that key once you've used it. Um, there's all kinds of assets we've actually created that no one's created before, like consumable things. Like normally a, a, an NFT asset exists forever on the blockchain, whether you want it or not. But, you know, like if something's a spell or a potion or, or ammo, right, then it should, you know, I don't want to know that I have a bunch of empty ammo cans. It should go away. It should consumed by use. That's one of many, many innovations that we've done. So if you go and look at that and read the white paper, you're going to see there's a lot of stuff that no one else is doing and it's going to be the platform for, for the gaming future, for the cross-game multi-chain, because it's going to be on EOS and Telos and maybe more later, um, you know, uh, gaming future that's going to be populated by all the modders who make awesome stuff for Elder Scrolls and stuff now. They'll make it, but for for D realms, and it's going to be cross chain. It's going to be super cool. 
And will that be stored? Will those NFTs be stored on IPFS? Yeah, yeah. So it's a decentralized gaming universe. Every it's end this end to end decentralization. So yeah, it's stored on IPFS. And the reason that's huge is because there's other standards that are being made, but uh, it's the crypto kitties phenomenon where okay, this standard's being made. Uh, you have these NFTs, but there is on a server there is a company that's controlling basically those NFTs. So. Uh, it's it's the illusion kind of an, of an NFT. When yeah, well, there's, there's NFTs in all cases. Those NFTs are the ownership record of them is on the blockchain. But correct. But the actual all, item. all the things that people think the picture and the 3D model and the animations and stuff like that. All the things people think of when they think of the token are stored in, on servers on AWS servers or something somewhere. Um, and if it goes down, you do not have access to. Or there is, I mean, in this probably wouldn't, this isn't something that necessarily there's any incentive for it to happen, but if the developers who control that server wanted to change your, uh, you know, your shirt from white to, to purple, they could do that. And now your NFT would display a different thing, wouldn't it? I suppose, right. That's kind of an edge case, but you certainly <laughs> can't do that with IPFS because the, the address of an object is a hash of it. So you can't change the object, the, the hash the address will change. So yeah, you you know, so you're you're covered against everything on IPFS. Yeah, I think IPFS, I mean it's it like you said, it's just edge cases, but IPFS gives that full end to end decentralization with Yeah, it. which is the which, which is, is the world we're living in, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, very, very exciting. Well, what a awesome show today. This was this was so I mean this is interesting. I I can't wait for people to hear it and, and hear just, I hope this brings some new people to, to know and research more about Telos because this, this is just crazy everything that's going on right now. So uh, thank you for coming on the Telos podcast. Go ahead and any final thoughts and any asks of the audience, go ahead and say your piece. All right. I just want to say thanks, uh, Brandon. It's, uh, it's been great being on here. I love your show. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, Telos work proposal system made it possible. And um, I think great things are happening. And, uh, you know, uh, if you want to, please vote Good Block. We, uh, we are a block producer and we uh, really try hard to, um, to support the chain. Absolutely. Well, Douglas, fantastic to talk to you today. And this is the Telos podcast funded by Telos and uh, big things happening. So cheers, everyone. Until next time. The money is not the prime asset in life. Time is...